This is a 2018 Burstner Harmony Line motorhome, and we're moving into it. It's German, umlaut over the U, but a multinational rigs that's built on an Italian Fiat Ducato 2.3 chassis. It's 7.4 meters long, weighing 7,000 pounds, and this footage was clearly not shot when we picked it up. Bugs were not included. It's powered by a whopping 120 horsepower, 2.3 liter, four-cylinder inline Iveco diesel engine. In other words, about the power of a Honda Civic. Since we're in New Zealand, steering's on the right and shifting on the left. That's gonna take some getting used to. The RV carries 30 gallons of water, 15 pounds of propane, and 2.5 gallons of sewage in its cassette black tank. It has a shower, full kitchen, queen bed, and another queen bed that comes out of the ceiling. We won't be using that. Water and air are heated by a Truma Combi unit and it has a huge pass-through storage bay for the ridiculous amount of luggage we brought along. The machine is sleek, but moves like a turtle. Tight in space, but huge on the New Zealand roads. It has everything we need and we are thrilled to be calling it home for the next five weeks. I'm Tom Morton and you are watching our adventures on the 8th continent. For this adventure, we were renting motorhomes from Wilderness RV Rentals and had arrived at their Auckland location to pick up our rigs. The crew was fantastic in getting us comfortable with our rentals, giving us tons of pointers, recommendations, and literature. North Island and the South Island right here. Oh, great. So it's got like heaps of places where you can go. And that works together with this map right here. They also showed us apps that would make our travels easier with ones, destinations, free campsites, and recommended routes. Area. Okay. Well, we finished up our paperwork and we're all ready to move into our new home on wheels for the month. It took a few hours to get moved in and educated on all the systems, as every RV is unique. And this was our first time using a European-designed RV. Luckily, the RV still had all the same basic systems as our U.S. models, just in different configurations and controls. Uh, it, I think this is going to work just fine. <laughs> the biggest difference by far, though, was the right-hand drive, as we have only ever driven on the left. When we were finally ready to hit the open road, I was a bit nervous. Oh, this is going to be weird. All right, on the right, stay in left. On the right, stay in left. Keep left. Yell at me as I much will. as needed to keep me on the left side of the road. I will. <laughs> okay. Play this way. Stay left. <laughs> oh. It's all right, just a water bottle. Ooh, this thing's kind of open. <laughs> Here we go. This does not feel right. <laughs> We're doing it. The adventure begins. <laughs> We're in the slow lane on the highway, which is on the left. <laughs> so weird. We made it through Auckland traffic and made our first stop at a grocery store to get loaded up on food. We of course wanted to buy as many New Zealand products as possible. This is one of our favorite things about RVing, being able to load groceries right into the RV. Except now, because this one's all new, we need to find where the heck they go. We love to be as flexible as possible with our travels, and RVs are a great way to enable this. We have a few high priority places that we want to visit, but otherwise we will be going where our whim takes us. While at Wilderness, we asked a lot of questions and made our decision that the first general area we wanted to head was north, to the area generally referred to as the Northland. We're back on the road. Uh, I'm starting to get comfortable with this whole left hand everything, which is good. We're going about two hours north today. We're going to camp at a place that supposedly has a glowworm cave. As our drive continued for the day, the weather deteriorated, and we quickly got a sense of New Zealand roads. Narrow, windy, and with lots of hill and mountainous sections.
After a few hours on the road, and once the sun had set, we found ourselves on some very steep and windy dirt back roads, heading for Waipu Caves. This is really narrow here, be careful. I was pretty exhausted from the drive, but we were going to be staying overnight at the parking lot for the caves. And since the caves are dark 24-7 anyway, we figured why not go exploring right away. The caves were cool and very damp with lots of standing water, and we found that water sandals or bare feet were the best choice for walking in the caves. So this is Waipu Caves, and as we've hiked in here, we've already started to see little glowing worms on the ceiling, and it's amazing. It's really slippery in here and wet, and supposedly we can walk through the water a ways. We've talked to a few people coming out, and they say that it's like a starry sky down there. Sure enough, as our eyes adjusted to the darkness, we started to see the majestic lights of glowworms on the cave ceiling. These blue glowing worms are the larval stage of a fungus gnat that eventually sprouts wings and flies. In this stage, they spin sticky webs that hang from the cave ceiling and glow blue to attract moths and other prey to their web. The bioluminescence is similar to fireflies, but it's a different enzyme that they cannot control, so they glow a constant blue. While they emit just enough light to kind of see by, with some long exposure time-lapse photography, we can really see these worms. Eventually, we headed back to the parking lot to sleep in the RVs for the night. And in the morning, we were glad to have seen the worms at night, because a whole school was exploring the caves on a field trip. Nonetheless, we hiked back to the entrance to see what it looked like by day. Mid-morning, we hit the road and headed further north, with our final destination being a northern beach. Along the way, we saw a sign for some waterfalls and made a stop for lunch. This was the Hato River Walk, and it made for an easy hike that gave us some spectacular views of the falls that dropped 26 meters over basaltic lava flows. After lunch, we continued north, the further north you go, the less populated it is, and we were looking forward to seeing some of New Zealand's wilderness after spending time in the big city. Our ultimate goal was the northern tip of the island, but along our way we decided to take a detour for a night over to a beach that was recommended by the Wilderness RV crew. Well. This secluded beach with tropical blue waters was almost all ours. So we pitched a blanket, brought out some snacks, and toasted to New Zealand. Our first swim in the ocean here in New Zealand. It feels fantastic. This water is so clear! As we returned to the RVs, we unexpectedly found some wildlife in distress. This seagull had swallowed a hook that was protruding from its neck. After clamping onto my hand, I was finally able to dislodge the hook and pull the fishing line free. Okay. And now can you reach, Good. reach down, reach and, down grab there and grab the hook and just pull it. Pull the hook out. Pull it out. Yeah. That's it. You got him. You did it. You did it. Nice job, Tom. Nice rescue job. Well, he's, he might still die. Well, he'll die free. He'll die free. Where did the hook go? I don't know. 
As evening neared, we were the only ones around, so we took hot showers and settled in for an incredibly peaceful night listening to the waves. The next day we checked the weather and found that further north it was going to deteriorate, so we decided to start heading south instead, and Caitlin started driving. It's going, it's going all right. It was like the last few days watching Tom, I was learning to drive on the left side as well, um, but now, I'm, so now I know all those things and I'm used to seeing traffic the way that it's coming at me, so it's kind of like when you first learn to drive and um, you've been driving with your parents but then the first time you're behind the wheel, you already know how to drive. It's just the first time behind the wheel. Our journey was taking us down the northwest coast. We were headed to the Waipua Kauri Forest. Waipua is renowned for its majestic kauri trees, species that have graced this land for millennia. Among these forest sentinels stands Tena Mahuta, the lord of the forest. This colossal kauri is the largest known tree of its kind in New Zealand, a symbol of strength, resilience, and connection. Named after the Maori god of the forests and birds, Tena Mahuta is estimated to be over 2,000 years old, and its presence is a bridge to the ancient world. The Waipu Kauri Forest faces challenges from environmental threats and a deadly Kauri dieback disease. Preservation efforts are crucial and visitors are encouraged to tread lightly and clean and sanitize their shoes before entering the forest. Once again, we had made the most of the day and were looking for a place for the night after dark. We settled into a trailhead parking lot at the base of the monumental Mungarahu Rock. So it's day four in the RV, and we really didn't have a plan when we picked them up, but we drove north. We weren't even thinking we were going to come up to the Northland, but we've already seen some amazing stuff. Yeah, we've been really enjoying the RVs. We've been uh, freedom camping here, which is their word for boondocking. Uh, no hookups and uh, just kind of out in nature. We're, we're parked at Marangarao <laughs> uh, Rock, which uh, all the names here we, we can't say, uh, which is kind of cool, it's kind of fun. Um, but we're, we're parked here. We arrived late, so we didn't even know what the rock looked like. So this morning it was kind of fun to have that surprise. And today we start heading south and we'll go to the Coromandel Peninsula where they have a hot water beach. It was a long day of driving and traffic through Auckland again. The Coromandel Peninsula is known for spectacular coastlines, resorts, and one very unique beach. We were checking into a campground for a few nights to refresh resources and amenities and visit the beautiful peninsula. This thing is ridiculous! We are camped here at Hot Water Beach. It is a very unique place, but it requires a spade. This remarkable beach offers a phenomenon that captivates visitors from around the globe. Twice a day, in sync with the low tides, a miraculous transformation occurs, and people swarm the sand. Warm geothermal water bubbles up through the sand, allowing beachgoers to sculpt their own personal spas right on the water's edge. The secret behind this natural spa lies deep in the Earth's surface, where underground hot springs heat the water to temperatures as high as 64 degrees Celsius. It's 
this has turned out to be more fun than it looked initially with all these people. And you'd think that just laying in two or three inches of water is that pleasant. But it's actually quite nice. The warm sun above and the hot water below. But and the cool breeze? Our time is almost up as the waves destroy pool after pool. Luckily we're one of the higher ones on the beach, but I don't think it's gonna last long. On the Coromandel Peninsula, we also biked to the trailhead for Cathedral Cove. The journey to Cathedral Cove begins with a scenic trek meandering through verdant foliage and offering breathtaking vistas of the coastline. So I don't mind hiking uphill or downhill. But to go uphill and downhill and uphill and downhill and uphill and downhill to end up where you started, <laughs> I, I object. And then it appears, the grand archway of Cathedral Cove, a monumental natural structure that frames the azure waters of the Pacific. It's a truly spectacular place to spend an afternoon, and the cove's clear waters invited a refreshing swim. After a week on the road, we were realizing that we had made a great choice to see this country by RV. In the short time we were on the road, we had already experienced so much and discovered that this is a very RV-friendly country. As we traveled further south, we were able to freedom camp at various locations and enjoy some additional peaceful stays before getting a taste of New Zealand's wild side.